Hello everyone, uh, good morning on this Sunday. Just bear with me for one second whilst I get set up. Um, whilst I'm doing that, why don't you guys tell me how your week has gone and also uh, where you're actually tuning in from so that I can say hi to you. That's assuming your comment shows up because as we all know, Facebook's particularly fantastic with um, creating bugs all over the place. Um, yeah. So yeah, let me know how your week has gone and um, what you guys have been up to. Um, for those of you, I heard that um, a whole bunch of different places are going back into some kind of temporary lockdown situation, not just Malaysia. Um, I was told that it's happening in the UK and um, in Canada as well. So yeah, let me know how you guys are doing. Um, so we just finished the first week of the CMCO. I'm, get, I'm losing track of all the <laughs> acronyms. But um, we're, yeah, we just finished the first, first week of the CMCO in Malaysia. Um, I went down to KL last night to volunteer with Kachar Soup Kitchen. So I had to get a permission slip letter permit from the police. Um, and... Uh, there was a roadblock leaving Bentong. There was a roadblock entering Gomba. Um, and then a roadblock in the opposite direction as well. So yeah, the police asked where I'm going, what I'm going to, what I'm going to be doing. So I told them that I'm volunteering in a pusat kebajikan in a soup kitchen. So yeah, it, it was smooth. Um, there was no traffic on the road, if you can believe it. It took me one hour and 15 minutes to get from Bentong to downtown KL, which never happens on a Saturday night. So, um, yeah, I hope everyone's doing okay with the first week of the CMCO. Um, just waiting for a few more people to join us. Um, a couple of quick reminders. Um, if you guys haven't already signed up for the Semiramichi Mantra Retreat, which is coming out on the 29th of October up to the 31st, um, please do so ASAP. As far as I know, <clears throat> there are only a handful of spots um, remaining. Spaces are limited, very, very limited. So there are only a handful of spots remaining for this mantra retreat, right? So it's a good opportunity um, to connect with our Lama, to connect with the present and future incarnation of our teacher, as well as to clear obstacles and uh, generate great amounts of merit for Rumchi Swift Return. So um, if you haven't already signed up for it, please do so ASAP. Um, hey, Kok Lian. Oh, hi Debbie. Debbie, I got your email. I will reply to it as soon as this live stream is over later this afternoon, all right? Um, if I don't get an opportunity to do so, do um, shoot me an email to remind me. Um, I will actually be doing a personal retreat today and tomorrow. Um, so three sessions today and then four sessions or three sessions tomorrow, depending on time. So um, yeah, I'll be doing that today and tomorrow. Um, and uh, yeah, oh, other thing before we get started today is um, volunteering for the Stupa project. So the Sam Rimshi Relic Stupa project um, that will be resuming soon. Um, watch out for announcements on WhatsApp, um, maybe on Facebook. And uh, the person to contact will most likely be Karen, but that might change. Like I said, watch out for the announcements, all right? Um, volunteering in the sense that if, for example, you have experience with mantra rolling, um, that's something you might be able to do from home. Okay, so um, just because you're not able to come to KFR doesn't mean that you won't still be able to contribute. So do keep your eyes peeled for that. Okay, so um, yeah, before, as usual, before we start on today's sharing, um, going to do a short prayer to ascribe the source of the uh, information that's going to be shared today. I go for refuge in my Lama, from whom I receive these teachings. I go for refuge in the lineage Lamas, from whom my Lamas receive these teachings. All right, uh, thank you guys very much for joining us here, um, joining me here today on this Sunday. Um, yes. Kokyan, good point. Um, if the CMC was extended for Kiong Salango, you won't be able to travel to KFA for the mantra retreat. But 
there is a contingency plan, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know what it is, but I heard um, discussions that there were discussions about it. Um, but nevertheless, sign up anyway, because if it's not extended, then you may have missed out on a spot, right? So, yeah. Um, before I go on today, also, um, before we get started today, yeah. So last week, I talked about judgment. Um, last week, I, it was part one, and I ran out of time because I was sharing too many anecdotes. Um, but today, we're going to continue with part two of the sharing on um, judgment. And uh, before I go on today, I um, wanted to thank the sponsors of, sponsor of today's talk, um, who would like to remain anonymous but would like to dedicate their sponsorship to the following. Uh, may obstacles be cleared so that His Eminence, the 25th Samaramuchi students, uh, can swiftly find the incarnation. All right, so thank you very much to the anonymous sponsor of today's talk. Um, if you would like to sponsor the talk or sponsor a talk, uh, there is a link in the description section of this live stream video. So um, please click on it because like I say every week, uh, your support does help us to keep making these programs available for everyone. And if the CMCO, you know, continues, then um, face-to-face, in-person uh, courses may no longer be possible. Um, so we will need to continue to do this online, all right? Um, yeah, so let's do a quick recap um, of what I talked about last week. I say quick. But um, as we all know, our retention isn't particularly fantastic. And um, sometimes we remember and don't practice. Sometimes we practice without remembering. I don't know how that's possible, but uh, let's do a recap of what I talked about last week. Um, so yeah, uh, last week I talked about why, one of the reasons, well, the reason why I wanted to talk about judgment or sitting in judgment, um, because it's a topic Judgment is a topic that I had raised in previous weeks, um, especially in relation to sharings on things like uh, disappointment, how to deal with disappointment, or um, how to deal with guilt, how to deal with regret. So um, oftentimes when we experience those feelings, we judge ourselves as being bad or we judge those reactions as being bad. And um, it's automatic, it's natural um, for us to feel or think that way um, or to react that way. And we are then, on top of that, told that it's bad to be judgmental, which in itself is a judgment. And so it then compounds and then it adds to feelings of guilt or regret or disappointment or whatever else that we're feeling at the time. All right, so um, there are all of these qualities like regret, um, like bitterness, jealousy, envy, and so on, um, that we would like to get rid of as quickly as possible and uh, to stop and acting as quickly as possible. Um, and then we are led, you know, oftentimes we are led to think that these qualities are bad. And um, it's actually more constructive for us to think of them as being unhelpful. Um, it's more constructive to think of them as being harmful to us. Okay, so when we approach our practice, how can we approach it wisely? How can we approach it constructively? Um, and how can we approach it free from judgment? And why is it helpful to recognize that um, it's judgment and to redirect that judgment energy and to adapt it into a useful tool uh, for our practice? So that is why I actually wanted to talk about judgment, is how we can use um, judgment energy and redirect it into something that's constructive and something that's helpful and beneficial to our practice, all right? So last week, what I did was I began by... Um, defining or distinguishing the difference between judgment and discernment and um, if you guys remember bonus points if you do um, if you guys remember i talked about how discernment is judgment that's f uh, free from any additional uh, actions so judgment is literally uh, sorry discernment is literally perceiving things as the way that they are and it stops there so um, discernment is the perception, is perception actually, um, that's in the absence of judgment. All right. Good morning, Xiao Li. Thank you for joining us this morning. All right. So um, discernment is perception in the absence of judgment and it, that's it. It doesn't move beyond that. Judgment, on the other hand, is um, when we have expectations or we have preferences for a situation or for a particular event. And um, these preferences are projected and it's in addition to discernment. 
So when we judge, whether we're judging directly or indirectly, or whether we're judging um, inexplic- inexplicably, or explicably, or explicitly, or inexplicitly, um, we are making a comparison between how things are with the way we feel things ought to be or the way that we feel things are supposed to be. So when we engage in judging, there is actually an element of dissatisfaction. And um, the dissatisfaction is with the way that things are and um, it's with our desire. There's an additional component of a desire for wanting to have things a certain way and then this desire not being met. Alright, so the example that I gave last week Ah, no problem, Joyce. Still, un- I can still understand your comment. So the example I gave last week um, to help people to understand the difference between judgment and discernment is a judgment is like someone who's sitting in court and giving a final pronouncement on or giving a final verdict on someone being guilty or someone being innocent. Discernment, on the other hand, is um, like a music teacher. So a music teacher observing um, our playing and then our music teacher giving us feedback on what it is that we can improve. And this feedback isn't personal, it isn't on the person, but rather this, and it's not also, it's not on the person's ability or the person's potential as a musician, but the feedback is on how we can improve, all right? So the teacher focuses on our actions and uh, focuses on helping us to look for ways for us to become better, for us to improve, all right? Um, I also gave the example of, you know, um, having a friend who is, very talkative or having a friend who um, eats a lot or having a friend who spends a lot of money. So judgment would be, well, Thomas spends so much money. And when you say it with that tone or you think it with that tone, it's with the expectation that Thomas shouldn't spend so much money, that Thomas should be more thrifty, that Thomas should should save more, that Thomas um, shouldn't spend so much money. On the other hand, if you are discerning something, it's a neutral statement, it's it's a neutral thought. It's without any bias or without any preference or without any sense of dissatisfaction about what Thomas ought to do or what Thomas ought not to do or what Thomas is supposed to do or what he's not supposed to do. So if you say Thomas spends so much money and it's said or it's thought with a neutral tone, that's discernment. It's an observation or description of what is happening or an observation or description of an event. All right. So um, then last week, I also talked about the three truths um, that were taught by Buddha Shakyamuni um, about why... Um, we are not necessarily in position to judge. Uh, The first truth was that um, we're not in a position to judge because we can't trust ourselves to see through our delusions on our own. And because we can't trust ourselves to see through our delusions on our own, um, it is very good for us to have a trustworthy friend, which is what Buddha Shakyamuni recommended to his son Rahula, um, that he should look at his own mind as if he were looking in a mirror and that when he observes certain things that he should talk about it and discuss it with a trustworthy friend. So last week I brought up that example, brought up that truth and also talked about how um, we should have a certain kind of attitude or hold a certain kind of approach when we're discussing with a trustworthy friend. And the importance of this approach is such that it's even mentioned in the vows. So in the vows, it talks about how uh, you should make yourself someone who can be addressed and you should not make yourself someone who cannot be addressed. So um, being open with feedback and being open with um, criticism, even if it's delivered, whether it's delivered harshly or whether it's delivered softly, being open to that feedback. All right. Um, that was the first truth of, uh, that I talked about last week. The second truth that I talked about last week was that we actually do need to be careful um, who we consider a trustworthy friend and that we should aim to be neither judgmental nor non-judgmental. So um, the reason why we need to be careful about who we trust is because our judgment actually does have power because depending on who we select as a trustworthy friend, it can have a long-term impact. Whether it's somebody who is... Um, positive and beneficial or someone who will be harmful to our practice. So aiming to be, uh, we should try not to be judgmental in the sense that don't depend on your knee-jerk reactions of who you like and who you don't like and aiming to be non-judgmental in the sense that you lose all sense of discernment and you assume that everybody that you come across is equally reliable as a trustworthy friend. All right. So then I talked about how it is we can be careful about who we trust if we are not in a position to see through delusions on our own. And that's where guidelines come in. So for example, when we 
need guidelines for what we consider to be virtuous behaviour versus non-virtuous behaviour that um, we have things like the vows to help us to discern what is virtuous and what is non-virtuous. When we would like to have guidelines for what we consider to be a trustworthy friend and not a trustworthy friend, therefore we have guidelines like the 50 verses of Guru Devotion. And how, it, how is it that we can tell that these guidelines are suitable guidelines if, again, we are unable to see through this, uh, delusions on our own? We can tell that these guidelines are suitable guidelines because we can look at the examples and the results of people who have come before us who have actually put it into practice. So you don't need to look at you know, um, people who may necessarily be unrelatable to us at this stage, um, like for example, you know, old monks and so on. But we can look at our Dharma brothers and sisters and the people who are around us and people who have committed to practicing and putting these guidelines into practice and seeing how they have transformed and how they've improved and how they've grown over the years since they've started putting these guidelines into practice. And so that brings us to the third truth um, of what Buddha Shakyamuni taught about why we may not necessarily be in a position to judge. And that is because um, we can't be a fair judge of other people's integrity until we've developed some of our own, or we can't be a fair judge of other people's qualities until we've developed some of the positive qualities of our own. All right, and so this is the most uncomfortable truth. Um, which I mentioned last week, because um, it requires us to take responsibility for our actions and our decisions in the sense that when you take stock and you do an inventory of the qualities that you have or have not developed, what you're actually doing is recognizing and acknowledging that we may not necessarily have put as much effort as we should have done or um, has, would have been possible into the development, into the progress of our practice. And we need to you know, take the responsibility for that. Um, it's also, it, also, it is also uncomfortable because, um, in the sense of having to take responsibility for our practice because at that point, once you've taken inventory of the qualities that we need to improve and the qualities that we need to reduce, and then we look at um, how we can do so, it means having to take responsibility, having to commit to putting these guidelines into practice. All right? um, it means that when we make the decision to put these guidelines into practice, that if we don't go all the way with them, there's no one that we can hold responsible for our lack of effort except for ourselves. All right? And so that makes people very uncomfortable because as we all know, even in a secular environment, not everybody is so fantastic with commitment. All right? um, then last week, I also talked about how um, judgment is not necessarily helpful because um, it's a reinforcement of our dissatisfaction and dissatisfaction being one of the um, types of suffering being one of the qualities of suffering that buddha shakyamuni taught about so um, when we judge all the time we are um, reinforcing our dissatisfaction because we are constantly habituating ourselves into thinking well this is how things should be and this is how things should not be this is how things ought to be and this is how things ought not to be then I also talked about how dissatisfaction is not necessary. Oh, sorry, judgment is not necessarily helpful because it's a reinforcement of our attachments and of our dual way of thinking. So our preferences and our likes and dislikes, which are not universally shared. Um, I talked about how judgment is a recipe for unhappiness because if we think back to all of the people who are constantly judging and or who are constantly expressing their judgment, even if you think of it in a very platonic social media-ish kind of sense, what kind of energy are they giving off? And they're giving off an energy of people who are very happy and people who are very light and who are very uh, forgiving and people who really like to be around? Or are they giving off an energy um, that's very down and you know, feels like it's dragging you down? So even when you judge, I asked you, I asked you guys last week to think, even when you judge, how do you feel? You may have the temporary satisfaction at the moment of judging where you feel like, oh yeah, you know, I'm in the right. But after that, how do you feel? Do you feel great about having judged someone or do you not necessarily feel that fantastic all right so um judgment i spoke about last week is not necessarily helpful because it's a recipe for unhappiness and then linked to that judgment also is not necessarily helpful because it's a recipe for loneliness so if you think again if you think back to all of the people who you know um especially um, with respect the people who are older who are constantly judging are those the type of people that you like to be around if they are not necessarily the type of people you like, you like to be around, um, I'm not talking about responsibility, I'm not talking about obligation, but I'm talking about people that you naturally gravitate towards. So if they are, if they are not 
necessarily people whom you, you naturally gravitate towards. Think about the causes that you are creating for yourself to become somebody like that in the future. All right? So those people 20, 30, 40, 50 years ahead of us, they spent that additional amount of time reinforcing their habit of judgment. We now are in a position where we can break that habit, where we don't necessarily have to go down that path. So what is it that we can do now that will stop us from becoming the same people who we do not naturally gravitate towards? All right. So judgment is a recipe for loneliness because just as much as you don't like to be around um, people who judge, people will also not like to be around you when you're always judging. All right. And then finally, I also talked about how judgment is a recipe for suffering because um, it's a reinforcement of all our desires. It's a reinforcement of our anger. It's a reinforcement of our bitterness. It's a reinforcement of our disappointment. It's a reinforcement of our expectations. All right. So all of these combined together create the causes for us to become unhappy, to suffer in the future. On a very basic, mundane level, human beings as social creatures, we like being around other people. How much we like being around other people, how often we like being around other people, and how much we enjoy being around other people, that differs. But ultimately, we all depend on one another to survive, or dependent on one another for spiritual progress. So, if we are constantly judging and creating all these causes for us to be lonely, to be without other people, um, for people to dislike us, ultimately, it is a recipe for suffering, right? So, before I continue um, with today's sharing, which deals with how we can stop or how we can reduce, okay? So I'm not going to talk about stopping because stopping is uh, stopping overnight, stopping immediately is extremely difficult for us. I mean, if something as simple as going to silent retreat is very difficult for people, so stopping the act of speaking um, or cutting, cutting out the act of speaking um, is very difficult for people. Or, for example, not scrolling on a phone constantly. If that is a habit that's very difficult for people to break, even more so a habit like judgment, all right? So I'm not going to talk about stopping judgment. I'm going to talk about reducing judgment. So before I go into um, sharing some of the tools and methods that Rimshi has previously shared with us on how we can reduce the habit of judging, um, I want to ask you guys, excuse me, I want to ask you guys if, um, and I want to know if any of you guys have observed yourself engaging in the act of judgment over the last week. Um, why do I bring this up? Again, you're not good, you're not bad if you, you're not bad if you judge and you're not good if you don't judge. I'm not talking about that at all. Purely as an act of ob observing whether you have judged or engaged in the act of judgment in the past week and how often and how automatically that act of judgment came. Everything around us primes us to judge. Why? Very simple. Because sales relies on us engaging in judgment. Advertising and marketing relies on us engaging in judgment. And so all of these industries basically thrive off the act of us feeling dissatisfied with our lives and with what we have and with what we are and what we surround ourselves with. All right? So people are you know, constantly bombarded with messages to think that my life would be happy or my life would be more exciting if I could travel more. Or um, my life would be improved if I bought that new house. Or, you know, um, my life would be improved if I bought that new car. And so, yeah, like I said, entire jobs and entire industries are created around the amplification of um, our dissatisfaction and playing into our desires, all right? And part of the challenge um, is with social media because it creates so many opportunities for us to compare and for us to judge. Um, and we are surrounded by this type of messaging each time we open our phones or each time we open, turn on our computers or we turn on our laptops. Um, for example, oh, okay, for, yeah, for example, like if you go onto Instagram, it's very, very easy for us to think that, um, oh, well, this person should, shouldn't be flaunting their wealth so much. It's so gauche for them to do so it's you know or so on 
um, or this person shouldn't have shared their opinion, that person shouldn't have shared their personal experience, it's too personal, why are they doing it, it's not right, it's not appropriate, that person shouldn't have uploaded that picture, it's not good for them to do so, or that person shouldn't be wearing that. So everything we see, everything that we surround ourselves with um, these days and everything that we are surrounded by these days primes us and encourages us to engage in the act of judgment, all right? So what I want to say is that if you have judged in the last week, if you have engaged in the act of judgment in the last week, you're not special, you are not unique, you are not bad, all right? Um, but think back in the last week, a particular moment or specific instance that you can recall during which you, you engaged in the act of judgment and think how many times do we engage in that behavior and how automatically and how unconsciously and with such a lack of awareness did we engage in that act of judgment all right so since the world ah good morning aggie thank you for joining us this morning um yeah so since we since the world primes us to engage in the act of judgment how can we reduce this habit as I have brought up in previous weeks, um, the first thing to do, the very first thing to do is to take a breath. And I know it sounds very simplistic and I know it sounds very reductionist, but it is a very, very, very helpful tool for us to break the habit of automatically reacting towards something or, automa or engaging in some kind of knee-jerk reaction towards something. So as they say, if you're about to respond in anger to somebody else, stop, take a deep breath, take a moment, and then react. If you get a nasty email from somebody and you're about to open it and then bang out a response, you know, in reaction, stop, take a deep breath, and then come back to it when you're not emotion-led. So the same thing with judgment. When you feel yourself falling into the act of, or into the habit of judging again, stop and take a breath. How do you know that you're going to fall into the habit of engaging in judgment? Meditation. All right, because meditation does help us to make ourselves aware of perhaps triggers or physical sensations that we may experience when we're about to engage in the act of judgment. For example, when people are going to fall into anger, there are physical, there are physical sensations about over anger. When people are about to go into boredom, there are physical sensations associated with boredom. Same thing with judgment, all right? So seriously, just stop, take a breath, and then react. Because our automatic reaction is to judge, is to jump, into, jump to conclusions and then to react. So why does taking a breath help us so much? Taking a breath, stopping and taking a breath, gives us a moment to switch our mind from judgment to discernment. Because discernment is not our natural reaction, whereas judgment is, or rather not natural. Discernment is not our automatic reaction, but rather judgment is. All right? And taking a breath helps, us, helps to give us a moment to reframe our language. So, good morning, Iman. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, yeah, so... Taking a breath gives us a moment to reframe our language. Let's say you see someone doing or behaving in a way that you don't necessarily agree with because all of us have a lot of expectations and um, have a lot of, we project a lot of expectations on the way that people are supposed to be and uh, the way that situations are supposed to be. So let's say we see somebody doing or behaving in a way that we don't necessarily agree with. Instead of asking them to stop in a very um, accusatory or judgmental tone, taking a breath gives us an opportunity to reframe our language, to reframe our question. Reframe, not refrain, okay? So just think, if we don't like being judged, other people don't like being judged as well. And if we react badly to being judged, how will somebody else react when we are judging them? So... That is how oftentimes much interpersonal conflict arises 
because we are so quick to judge somebody and we're so quick to express our judgment to somebody that in, instead of it making the situation better, it makes the situation worse or it escalates the situation. So taking a breath helps us to switch from judgment to discernment. Now, think about someone who annoys you. Think about someone who provokes you, who irritates you, who aggravates you. Um, who, yeah, who annoys you. When you take a breath, you also give yourself an opportunity to observe your own mind and to actually analyse the situation and think. Can you let that person be the way that they are without desiring them to be otherwise, without desiring them to be another way? If they are the way that they are and you don't express your judgement or you don't express your thoughts, will it be harmful to you? Will it change anything about you? Will it change anything for them if you were to express your expectations, if you were to express your judgments, if you were to express your dissatisfaction? Maybe you have good intention, maybe you have a good motivation and maybe you think that, well, if I say it this way, then um, it will help them. But is it necessary? Do you need to say it? Or are you just saying it or are you just expressing it because there's an itch that you want to scratch? Just as I say that, my arm gets itchy. But are you saying it just because um, you, you want to scratch an itch um, and it's got absolutely nothing to do with the other person? It's just that you've got this itch to judge and you've got this itch to express your judgment and so you want to say it, you want to verbalise it, you want to express it anyway. Alright, so taking a breath helps, also helps us to analyse the situation, to analyse ourselves and to discern and to decide whether it is we are expressing something for the benefit of the other person or because we literally have an, a scratch that we, an itch that we want to scratch and we just want to judge somebody else and we have no thought or no care for how the other person may react. So taking a breath helps us to reframe our language, it helps us to switch from judgment to discernment and it also helps us to analyse the situation and to see whether what it is we're about to express will be helpful or beneficial to the other person, right? And so, that is why Rinpoche also asked us to meditate on ourselves. And that is another way for us that we can reduce our judgement. Rinpoche asked us to think, do we annoy the people? We may think that we are fantastic, we may think that we are perfect, we may think that we are accomplished and realised and achieved and, you know, um, we deserve to sit on a throne and we deserve for people to praise us, but are we really like that? Or do we annoy people? Do we irritate people? Um, do we offend people? Are there things that we do or we say that get on other people's nerves and that rub them up the wrong way? How do we react when we are judged for those things? So the Rinpoche asks us to meditate and think, are we really as perfect as we think that we are? Are we really as accomplished as we think that we are? Are we really as patient or as caring as we think that we are? Or popular as we think that we are? Or do we annoy other people? Do we irritate other people? And when people bring that up to us and we feel that people are judging us for them, how do we react? Do we feel that their comments, do we feel that their feedback was justified or did we feel that their feedback were judgments? Did we feel that their so-called judgments were warranted or that their so-called judgments were deserved? Or did we get defensive? Did we get irritated when people expressed those so-called judgments of us? Did we then try and justify ourselves or justify our behaviour or justify our speech? Did we get annoyed at people when they express their opinions and we felt that their opinions were unsolicited. Alright, so when we think about all of those things, Rimshia said, when we think about all of those things, why are we then surprised that people react the way that they do when we judge them or when we express our judgments of them? Alright? When you meditate in that way and when you think about things in that way, Thinking about it over and over again, meditating on it, contemplating on it, contemplating on our behaviour, we then understand and we then are able to make ourselves, practice making ourselves more aware of 
why it is unhelpful for us to judge somebody else. And when we think about that, and we meditate on that, contemplate on it over and over again, we become aware of it. That awareness from the meditation cushion then grows. So from one minute, it grows to two minutes, to three minutes, and so on, until it grows off of the meditation cushion. And so we abide in a state where we realize constantly that it's unhelpful for us to judge. And so we will be more, we will develop the tendency to stop ourselves from falling into the act of judgment. All right? It helps us to realize that there is enough space in the world for everyone. Whether or not these people are conforming to the way that we think that they ought to be or the way that we think that they're supposed to be. All right? There's enough space for everyone in the world. At the same time, there's also enough space for you. There's, en there's also enough space for me. Sometimes when we judge, in fact, for many of us, um, the judgment isn't always necessarily about other people, but we're also constantly judging ourselves. Am I good enough? Have I done enough? Do I move fast enough? Do I think quick enough? Do I speak quickly enough? Do I react fast enough? Did I make the correct decision? Am I doing the best I can for my family? So for many of us, the judgment isn't necessarily always directed to the outside world, but it's also direct, directed internally to ourselves. So what, what I want to say, what I want to share, what I want to remind us is that just as much as there is space in the world for everyone, regardless of how we think they should be, or how we think that they're supposed to be, there is also enough space in the world for us. We are not bad people. You are not a bad person. You are not an evil person. You are, like so many of the rest of us, somebody, a sentient being on this earth, who has qualities to work on and who has qualities to improve. So, remember that and realize that there is enough space in this world for you and that you are not a bad person and that you're not an evil person just because you are sometimes angersome, just because sometimes you have pride, just because sometimes you get jealous, just because sometimes you are disappointed. All right? So, yes, that's, that's one of the reasons why Rinpoche asked us to meditate on ourselves was because when we meditate on ourselves and we meditate on um, how we are and we meditate on the fact that actually, just like everyone else, we do have qualities that we need to improve on, then we realise that we are worthy, then we realise that there is space in this world for us, then we realise that we're not bad people, we're not evil people and that we're not necessarily unique in the so-called embarrassing qualities that we continue to have or that we continue to engage in, all right? So, the thing, the thing, oh, sorry. The thing about thinking about um, that people are supposed to be a certain way is that it leads us to suffering because people are not fixed and people are always changing. So, over and above, or in addition rather, in addition to meditating on ourselves and meditating on our judgments and meditating on um, and realizing that there's space in this world for everyone. Rinpoche also asks us to meditate on impermanence. What's not permanent? What is not permanent is our likes and our dislikes. What is not permanent are our preferences. What is not permanent are our expectations because all of these things change as we grow, as we get older, as we get more information, as we gain more experiences, as we go through more in life. What you like and what you don't like now is very, very different to what you like and did not like one year ago or what you liked and did not like when you were a child. When I was growing up, I hated tomatoes. Absolutely hated tomatoes. I know it's a very rudimentary example, but even for f things as simple as food, right? There are, I hate, there, there are things that we absolutely detest and things that we like. I hated tomatoes for many, many years. Even ketchup, hated it. And then one day, out of nowhere, suddenly, I really, really liked it. It was winter in England. Not the season for tomatoes, but suddenly I really, really liked tomatoes. And so overnight, my preference changed from no tomatoes to yes tomatoes. Again, rudimentary example, but there are things that change in terms of our preferences, in terms of our expectations, as we grow, as we develop, as we experience more. How you 
what expectations you have for a relationship, for example, when you are 13 or 14 or 15 or 16, are very, very different to the expectations that you have for a relationship now. All right. So all of us have many examples in our life that can show that um, our likes and our dislikes, our preferences and expectations are not permanent. These things change as we get older, these things change as we learn more, and these things change as we gain more experience. What is also not permanent are situations. What is also not permanent are other people. The situations change, the situations that we're judging change, and the people that we're judging change. People's decisions, people's speech, people's knowledge and people's experience and so on. These things change as they get older. These things change as they learn more, as they gain more experience. So why is it that we are judging or casting judgment on other people based off of something that's not permanent on something that is not permanent? Why is it that we are creating negative feeling? Why is it that we are creating negative relationships? And why is it that we are creating um, negative karma off of an impermanent quality onto an impermanent quality or onto an impermanent aspect or situation. It's not worth it if you really think about it, alright? So if you meditate on impermanence, you realize that what you're judging from is not permanent and what you're judging and what you are judging is not permanent as well. So why create negative karma that you need to experience in the future from something that's impermanent onto something that's impermanent? It's not constructive, it's not useful, it's not helpful. We already have enough negative karma, we already have enough karma from countless previous lives to deal with. We don't need to be engaging in actions that create even more. All right? So, what Rimshi asks us to do and what Rimshi asks us to think about and meditate on impermanence is because it helps us to separate somebody's um, personality and qualities from their actions. It helps us to separate a person from their actions and when we can do that, then we tend to be more forgiving, we tend to be more accepting, and we will realise and understand that what the person is saying, what the person is thinking, is not who they really are. And that's how Rinpoche was always able to help people, even if those people were really nasty, even if those people were really um, negative, or had negative thought or negative view of Rinpoche, Rinpoche was still able to help them, because Rinpoche recognised that their view or their thought is not who that person is, that when a person is suffering, regardless of whatever it is that they think, those qualities about themselves are not permanent, so Rumchi never withheld assistance or never withheld help from them. Even if they really, really, even if their characteristics really, really bothered Rumchi. As a real bodhisattva, Rumchi never withheld help from a person based on how Rumchi felt towards them. All right? So, just as much as meditating and separating somebody's, uh, someone from their actions helps us to be more forgiving of them, it also helps us, and it also applies to ourselves as well. Okay, so if we're able to separate our inherent self from our actions and realize that our actions and our decisions and our thoughts and our speech are not permanent inherent qualities of us, it will help us to be more forgiving ourselves because we will see that we have or we will remember and recognize and acknowledge that we have the potential to change and we have the potential to transform these qualities which, which are temporarily non-virtuous and temporarily unhelpful to ourselves. Okay. When you're also more forgiving of ourselves, then there are other benefits to that as well. For example, becoming more willing to admit our mistakes to others, becoming more willing to admit that we were wrong to other people, and so on. All right, so don't really have time for it because I'm not going to get into that because I'm going to try and finish on time today. Okay, um, but it will help us to be less defensive when people point out things about ourselves to us, and that will help to create better interpersonal relationships and interactions with other people. All right. Um, Another method, another tool that Rinpoche shared with us for guiding us in practicing to reduce our habit of judgment is by maintaining equanimity. So judgment is us making a decision based on what we like and what we don't like, based on our preferences and based on our expectations. Um, it's us making a decision 
um, based on what we can gain from something or from someone and what we won't gain from something or from someone. Okay, what irritates us and what doesn't irritate us? Excuse me. So, the antidote to that is maintaining equanimity. What equanimity in practice means is walking the path between attraction and aversion. Um, between, it's, it's walking the path between our likes and our dislikes. It's walking the path between um, praise and blame. Um, and doing this without attachment to one side or the other, or without bias one side to the other. I Joyce, it's no problem. You know what? In fact, if you are really that tired, it's fine. You should go and rest. It's okay. This this video will be on afterwards, so you can watch it later, right? Um, it's fine. Go to go to sleep if you're tired. Okay. Um, yeah. So maintaining equan equanimity is a antidote to, or it's it's a tool for us to reduce our habit of judgment, because judgment is us making decisions based on our attraction and what we're averse to. And so equanimity is the antidote to that. Now, one thing, one, um, yeah, one, one, one tool, or one situation that Rimshi very often um, raised with us or taught us was um, a situation that we can use to practice um, reducing our habit of judgment is looking at things or looking at messages free from the tone with which it is delivered. So when someone comes and gives you feedback or when someone comes and gives you criticism, look at the content and look at the message and try to divest yourself of the tone. Try to separate the tone from that. Look at it as information which is beneficial or which is useful or not. Um, and then try to work out somebody's motivation or intent. The reason why Rimichi very often used this as an example for us to practice reducing the habit of judgment is because very often we make decisions based on how people deliver it. And if you think back to last week or the week before or whenever, how often have we said or made a decision based off of how someone delivered something? So, uh, yeah, I don't want to help that person because of the way they said that. Or, I'm not going to go to them because um, of the way they spoke to me last time. Or, I'm not going to do that because I didn't like the way that they told me. Okay, so, very often we find ourselves in situations where we make decisions based off, how, based off of how somebody delivered something. Personal example, there is someone that I know, that I see very, very often, that to this day when they deliver things, I find to be particularly jarring. They will express their thought, they will express their solution to a problem, they will express their feedback or they will express information in a way that sounds extremely judgmental or sounds extremely um, final and or very, very cutting. Now I know this person and I know this person has very good motivation and very good intent. So what helps me to not react to their tone is by remembering that the reason why they're expressing what they do or what they're saying is because they have good intent. All right, so um, there's always the initial shock when they open their mouth and they speak like, oh, like the table should be bigger or something like that. And the way it's said, it's like, oh, geez. Okay, I'm so sorry for you saying it that way. I'm so sorry for not having done it the way that you thought it should have been done. But when you think about it, and you think, okay, remove the tone, remove the way the person said it, and separate, it from, separate their message from the way that they said it, give them a chance to explain themselves. The next sentence usually is something that's very, very um, logical, that explains why they made the initial statement that they did. Just like the example I gave you guys last week of the doctor that I went to to deal with my injured ankle. The first thing he said, or one of the first things he said when I walked into the room was, you have to lose weight. And I was like, whoa, hang on. Where do you come off saying a statement like that? I've literally only just met you. Um, 
and dude, that's really bad bedside manner. And then he explained, because your ankles are this small and your ankles have to bear the weight of the rest of your body. And when he said that, I was like, oh yeah, that actually makes sense. You know, so the initial statement was delivered very jarringly and quite offensively. But when he explained it, it made sense. If I had reacted based off of the way, he, and if I had judged him based off the way he had delivered his initial statement, I wouldn't have continued going to see him. I wouldn't have been able to access the knowledge, the help, the information, the healing that he then was able to deliver to my ankle. He was right. I did need to lose weight because it would have helped my ankle to heal faster. He was right. But if I had judged him based off of his initial tone, I wouldn't have been able to benefit from his knowledge. All right, so maintaining equanimity is not an easy practice because, like I said, our automatic natural reaction is to judge. But taking a breath, stopping before we react will help us to practice, practice maintaining equanimity. Without us being jerked this way or that way, reacting this way or that way, all right? We are more in control of our reactions. So one practice that we can do, that we can all do on a day-to-day -day basis, and you will find, once I've brought this up, you will find that there are many, many examples in front of you, that one way we can practice maintaining equanimity is by separating information and content in somebody's message from the tone with which they delivered it, all right? So, um, when we are able to maintain equanimity, it also helps us to deliver just as much as it helps us to receive a message from someone independent of the tone with which they delivered it. It also helps us to deliver a message without making it about another person. So how many times have we delivered a message and resulted in a situation escalating because we made the message personal and we made the, the message about the person when it wasn't meant to be? So going back to the recap that I gave at the beginning of the sharing, the difference between judgment and discernment. Judgment is us expressing our dissatisfaction with something, um, thinking that it should be a certain way or it ought to be a certain way. Discernment is a music teacher giving us feedback on how we can improve our skills or how we can improve our abilities or how we can reach our potential without making it about the other person, right? So when we maintain equanimity, we are better able to deliver a message to somebody more effectively so that we can accomplish what it is that we want without offending the other person. All right, so what would you respond better to? A teacher who says, okay, you can improve if you practice on this particular aspect versus a teacher who says, you're so stupid, how come you don't understand? If you think that I'm joking, you know, about a teacher saying, you're so stupid, you don't understand, I will tell you that when I was in sixth grade, we are six, primary six, my maths teacher pulled me to the front of class, showed me off to everyone and said, everyone, this is what a stupid person looks like because I didn't know how to do um, some, I didn't know how to do it or solve some of the problems that were in front of me. And that one statement made me dislike maths for like the next five years, okay? So, yes, there are people who are not able to deliver a message um, particularly effectively. But when we are able to practice and we are able to maintain equanimity, we are able to deliver a message to somebody else um, that focuses on the action rather than making it personal to the person. All right? Making something personal is counterproductive because we never know what somebody is going through. We don't know why somebody is behaving or speaking or thinking the way that they are because we don't know everything that, about them. We don't know everything that's happening in their lives. Maybe someone has walked into the office that day and they are very short-tempered. Maybe they're very snappy. Maybe they are being very bossy and giving orders here and there. And then we judge them for it. Oh, that person's always so bossy. That person's always like that. But maybe that person walked in the way that they did that day because they had an argument with their partner before coming into work that day. So maybe their mood is down. Maybe that's why they're short, so short-tempered at work. Maybe they have plans for something that night and the plans fell through and the plans were something that they were really looking forward to. Maybe their parents are very sick, their parents are very ill, and so 
their mind is worried and focused on their parent and not focused on being civil or being polite at work. And so that's why they're so short-tempered, all right? So reacting to their mood, reacting to their act, action, reacting to their behaviour, to their speech, and judging them for it won't be helpful for the situation. And so that's why judgment is not helpful. Because judgment doesn't allow us to have compassion for somebody else. And so since judgment prevents us from having compassion for someone else, the antidote to judgment or a way that we can reduce judgment is by generating compassion for people. When we pray every day to be of benefit, to all mother sentient beings, does our prayer come with caveats? Does our prayer come with terms and conditions? I'll benefit this person if they stop being like that. I will help that person if they stop speaking to me that way. I will be compassionate towards the individual if they stop treating everyone like that. So when we pray, may all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering, does our prayer come with caveats or does our prayer encompass everyone, regardless of who they are, what they're doing, what they can do for us and their relationship with us. All right, so compassion is love that's free from judgment and love that's free from agenda. Love that's free from any expectation for self-gain or for self-benefit. So when we generate compassion, what we are trying to do is we're trying to make compassion our reaction and to replace our habit of judgment with a new habit, which is a new habit of compassion, focusing out. So think, how can I help this other person? And try to hold that thought, regardless of how you feel about them, um, regardless of what they've done to you, or regardless of what they can do um, for you and so on. All right? So because compassion is acting out of someone else's interest, because compassion is acting out of somebody else's uh, welfare or acting out of someone else's benefit or for the benefit of somebody else rather. Um, compassion is free from agenda, for any agenda that we have. Compassion is free from personal gain. Compassion is free from our personal feelings or free from our personal preferences, um, our personal attractions or personal aversions. And compassion is free from um, our relationship with the other person in the sense of what that person can do for me or what the person can't do for me. All right? So, generating compassion and practicing the generation of compassion over and over again um, is a way that we can... Um, rather, sorry. We should practice generating compassion over and over again to the point that it becomes an automatic reaction in replacement of our automatic reaction of judgment. What can I do for the other person rather than I don't like the other person or I don't like the other person because or I won't help the other person because I don't like the other person the way the other person spoke to me. I don't like the situation the other person created. All right. When you sit down every day and you do your sadhana every single day and you really focus and you really pray and you really generate compassion and you pray to benefit all mother sentient beings in the words of J.P. Tong, fake it until you make it. Do it over and over again until it becomes real. It becomes not just a thought or not just a good wish that's confined to our meditation cushion, but it becomes something that we can expand beyond the cushion. And that is what I talked about two weeks ago, I think, two weeks ago, where habits that we develop on the meditation cushion once we do it over and over again, become habits that we can then transfer to other people. Habits that we develop with our teachers then becomes habits that spill over um, to touch and to benefit and to um, influence our interactions with other people. All right? For example, Pasti um, Ye'i. Pasti Ye'i told us many, many years ago, the pastors, at, before we were pastors, before we were about to become ordained um, as pastors, Pastor Yi um, gave us a sharing and she told us that the first thought that she has every single day, the first thing she thinks of when she wakes up and she trains herself to think of when she wakes up is how can I be of benefit to someone else today? Um, what difference can I make in somebody else's life today? And that's the first thing that she's that's, that's what she has practiced um, to become the first thing that she thinks of every morning. And so if you generate that 
thought every single morning and it's possible because she's human just like the rest of us. And so if you generate that thought every single morning, how can I be of benefit to somebody else today? And then you carry that thought for the rest of your day. You set that intent and carried it for the rest of the day. When you have the wish to help somebody else, that replaces whatever judgment or whatever thought or whatever opinion you have on somebody else because what you want to do and all you want to do then becomes, I want to help them. All right? And so when you're practicing doing that, which is you're practicing generating compassion, you're practicing generating the wish to be of benefit to others, you stop giving so much energy, you stop giving so much mental space and time into judging somebody else. All right? So remember that a person may be behaving a certain way or speaking in a certain way or interacting in a certain way because they're going through something in their lives um, or they've gone through something previously and um, now this is the result that they have, all right? So generate compassion for them. Generate compassion for any previous experiences or any previous traumas or any previous situations that they may have gone through or found themselves in instead of judging them for being the way that they are. The way that you are now is the result of experiences, the result of decisions and actions that you've made and taken previously, all right? So just as much as you don't like to judge them, you don't like to be judged, someone else does not like to be judged either. So have compassion for them, all right? And so comes down to our last point for today, um, which is what Ramshi always advised us to do um, when we wish to reduce our habit of judgment, which is do our prayers, do our prayers, do our prayers. And Rumiji said that he knows that he sounds, like a, he sounds like a broken record for bringing this up over and over again. But that is just how important it is to do our prayers every single day. Not to just rush through them, but to sit down and to do them properly and to make the time to do them properly. Each day, when we do Ganen Lagyama, the Guru Yoga of Lama Tsongkhapa, and we visualize our mother and father on either side, we visualize all the people who've been kind to us, behind us, we visualize all the people who we perceive to be difficult in front of us. We are practicing generating equanimity because, and we're practicing non-judgment, as in not judging, because we are having to include every single person in our visualization, regardless of their relationship with us, or regardless of what we feel about them, regardless of what we think about them, regardless of what we have judged about them, all right? So taking the time every single day to do Ganen Hagema properly, for example, and engaging the visualizations properly is already an opportunity for us to practice not judging. It is already an opportunity for us to have one moment during which we are not judging. We are practicing that no one is above us, we are practicing that no one is below us, and we are practicing that everybody is equal. So we are also engaging in the practice of maintaining equanimity. Doing it over and over again is us practicing not judging them is us practicing loving all of them equally. It's us practicing the generation of equanimity, all right? So in the same way that our judgmental habits and our judgmental behavior can grow and grow and grow if it's left unchecked and if we keep reinforcing it by doing it automatically every single moment, every single day, in the same way we can also grow and we can also nurture, we can also encourage our habit of not judging. One good place that we can consciously do that is on our meditation cushion when we're doing our sadhana every single day, all right? Look at people who do their prayers regularly and who do up their prayers well and who engage in the visualizations and they do their practice because they want to develop attainments, not because they want to look good, not because they're doing it out of fear, not because they want to be praised for doing their sadhana regularly or whatever, but look at people who do their sadhana, who do their prayers and do their practices because they want to gain attainments. Look at how they improve and see how they change over the years. All right? That should tell you all that you need to do, all that you need to know about the power of prayer, about the benefit of doing our practices consistently. All right? So, that concludes for today. Yes, one hour 30 or one hour three minutes. Um, but if you guys have any questions, please feel free to leave me a comment um, in this live stream and I will respond to it either in the comment section or in next week's live stream. Um, again, take some time out now after this stream to meditate 
on the last week, since the last sharing, since part one of the sharing on judgment, have we engaged in any acts of judgment? Have we engaged in any behaviours of judgment? Um, Kok Lian shared earlier, um, I've judged in many occasions over the week. I think the challenge is we must be mindful that we have judged and decisions that we make should not be influenced by the judgment. It's challenging, but we should be on the journey. I completely agree. All right. Um, what, even, even after you've judged, but you're aware that you've judged, making a decision not to have your actions or have your speech influenced by their judgment is important. All right. So reflect on the last week because there are many opportunities online especially to engage in the habit of judgment. Reflect on instances during which you have judged. Did you allow your judgment to influence your decisions or to influence your actions as Scotland shared? Or did you not? Were there instances when you were more successful in engage, engaging in discernment rather than judging? All right. And if you discerned rather than judge, give yourself a pat on the back. And then as you move into this week, try, set yourself the intention that this week I will judge less and I will discern more. If that is something that's very difficult to do, then what we can also do is I've set the intent that for this week, when I feel myself falling into judgment, I'll stop, I'll take a breath before I judge something. All right. So quick reminders for what is happening today, this week. Um, tonight, again, on the Chinese Kachara Facebook fan page, there is the Doji Shukten um, Sadhana at 10pm um, with Pastor Shin. So if you guys have any requests for prayers or offerings to be made, um, you can leave a comment at the bottom of this live stream or you can leave a message on the Chinese Kachara Facebook fan page. All right? um, on Tuesday at 9.30, there's Easy Dharma for the New Normal with Pastor David. Oh gosh, excuse me. That's on the, on the Kachara Facebook fan page. And then on Thursday at 8pm on the Kacharan and friends Facebook group, there is the Sam Rinpoche Swift Return Puja. All right. Um, and then again, don't forget to sign up for the Sam Rinpoche Mantra Retreat, which is coming out on the 29th of October. Thank you guys so much for joining me today. I think it's like week 21. And thanks to my trauma of sixth grade math, I can't tell, I can't quickly calculate how many months it's been. You know, how many, how many months 21 weeks is, but whatever. Anyway. Um, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, if you guys, like I said, if you guys have any questions, uh, comments, or if you have any requests for prayers or offerings to be made, please leave a message in the comment section below this live stream, all right? Um, don't forget to do your dedications after this stream has ended. And um, if you are able to contribute to any of the talks, not just to any of the sharings rather, not just mine, but, you know, Pastor David's, JP's and, and so on, um, please Every contribution, um, every support helps us to continue making these programs available for everyone. All right. So thank you so much to today's sponsor. Thank you so much to you for taking the time out on your Sunday to join me. And I will see you guys same time, same place next week. Bye guys. Have a good week.